Two passages from the New Testament, first in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 4, verses 3 through 6, and the second passage from Matthew, chapter 28. Listen now, again, for the word of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of the darkness who has shown in the hearts, in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20, the final commission to the disciples. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Think of all the faces we show to the world every day. We're not exactly sure what they see in our faces. Last week during vacation Bible school, Jane and I were meeting with several of the five, four, three, and two-year-olds in different groups, and at the beginning of each time I would say, do you know who I am? And one girl raised her hand, sure, you're the guy who does stuff in the big church upstairs. And then another one said, you do talk a lot though. Another one said, even, you're even funny sometimes, and so that's the face that some people know. Truth is, we hardly ever show our real face to anyone except those who know us best, the ones who know who we really are behind our game face, the real you and the real me deep down. To everyone else, we change our faces, don't we? Think about it for a moment. The doorbell rings. Watch the contours of your face change as you grimace over the interruption. It depends on who's at the door. Perhaps it's a door-to-door salesman and you just have to be stuck listening to the pitch through the crack in the door, or it's a pesky neighbor who only comes over to complain about things, watch your face tighten as she talks until she says that her husband just died and she doesn't know who else to turn to. How does your face look now? Or perhaps it's Federal Express or UPS at the door and you're not happy about the inconvenience, but you go to the door anyway. Your face tightens up again until you see that the package is from your son or your daughter or the love of your life, and you can hardly open it fast enough. What does your face look like now? We show all different kinds of faces, different faces, depending on how we're thinking and feeling. This morning, I want to suggest to you that God does too. Oh, not anthropomorphically, no. God is God, and God does what God wants to do. God is never a pale projection of the human condition. And yet, I do believe that God shows many faces, 
If you look at the scripture closely, read the Bible closely, you will see the many faces of God. Look at the text this morning and you can see that the faces of God roughly approximate Father, Son, Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, Sender. Three faces, three different persons, and yet one God. Three faces and three ways to look at God. The first is the hidden God, which Isaiah must have seen in the temple that day in the passage Lucy just read. It appears to be a funeral because it says, in the year that King Isaiah died, and I want you to picture a youthful Isaiah joining a throng of Judeans passing through the palace to see this deceased monarch who is lying in state the way they used to lay out Russian leaders. But there's something more going on here. I want you to see as he passes into the temple a vision, a, a spiritual heart-rendering vision of the living king. It's something beautiful. Have you ever had an experience like that? It's so beautiful that everything else vanishes. Everything around it vanishes in a haze. I used to ride the bus a lot when I was a graduate student at Pitt many, many years ago. And I remember one day seeing a large elderly woman who was looking down over her knees at her shoe that was untied and, and she, she couldn't reach it. There was a young man across from her with wild hair and loud radio music, rock music, and he had tattoos all over his arm and he looked at the woman and smiled and knelt down and tied her shoe in a nice, neat knot, gently tied her shoe. And she patted him on the head and nodded a thank you. No words were spoken. It, it, I, I still remember it as if it were a Caravaggio painting that blocked out everything else that was going on. And when the spell was broken, I looked around and the whole bus was smiling. I wonder what Isaiah saw that day. He saw a vision, but it, it was a vision with smoke everywhere because it's the smoke of incense. And sometimes the smoke gets in your eyes and it changes your view of things. I remember worshiping at St. Catherine's Monastery at the foot of Mount Sinai many years ago. That amazing place, a six-story fortress with a church built by the Byz Byzantine Emperor Justinian in the sixth century of the Common Era. I had a letter of introduction from the patriarch of the whole Greek Orthodox Church in Istanbul, so I had a run of the place. But my most precious moments were in the main church, almost exactly the size of this. I can still remember the shafts of light crisscrossing the gilded hall as the Greek Orthodox monks chanted ancient tunes while swinging their large incense pots that shrouded everything in the room with smoke. It was like a scene from this passage in Isaiah. The hidden God is the one who comes to us only in glances and whispers. He is the, the deus absconditus, the, the hidden God, the one who dwells in obscurity. And the cloud around him is thick, and any Israelite who comes near may even die. You see, I think in this country we're way too chatty during worship. The way we worship, we miss the holiness of God. We need to still the chatter in our minds. That's what Rowena McNabb says to us at the beginning of a yoga class every time uh, here at IPC. You, you need to still the chatter in your minds. That's what we need to do in worship. We need to still the chatter. Be still and know that I am God, says the Lord. One day in Dallas, we gathered a lot of children who were like our equivalent to our summer reading program. We gathered them in the narthex, so we wanted to take them into church because many had never been into the sanctuary of our church. 
And they were wiggling and kicking each other and making noises, and the leader was trying to calm them down and introduced me back in the narthex, and I just stood there completely silent until they all quieted down. I said, we're going into a very special room now, and I want you to be completely quiet. Do you understand that? They all nodded like that. I said, I don't want to hear a sound from any of you because God is in this room. And as we entered, you could have heard a pin drop. And as they came in, every child sucked air in unison, glancing at the stained glass windows of the saints through whom the light of Christ shines. It was an amazing scene. I sometimes wonder what Isaiah saw that day, what he really saw. Scripture says that he saw seraphim, which are simply fire spirits. A seraph was an effigy to a foreign goddess, something sphinx-like, part human, part animal, six wings. Judah wasn't an independent country, and Uzziah, the king, was a practical king. He knew that he had to do obeisance to the Assyrians, and he needed to allow the Assyrians to have these seraphim, their foreign gods, in his temple court, and so he did. And Isaiah, with his human eyes, could see these odd, ugly monstrosities, but with the eyes of faith, he saw them gathered around, clustered around the throne of God, serving the living God. That's how he visualized it in his mind, this hidden God who was there before him. It is a beautiful sight. So today I want you to imagine all of our gods, all of our seraphim, things we bow down and worship, beautiful cars, lovely homes, a place at the lake, a place at the beach, a place in the mountains, stock options, trophies. I want you to see them all around the cross here this morning, all blanked out because all you can see is the cross because that's the most important thing. Not all these seraphim that we think we love and worship, these idols. And if you can see that, then you will get a glimpse, only a glimpse, of what Isaiah saw that day. So the first face of God is the hidden face of God, but the hidden God is also the Savior God, which brings us to the second face, which is the human face of God. In traditional theology, we call that one the Christ, the Son of God, Jesus, the Messiah. This is God in human form for you and for me, and only when we have the eyes of faith do we have the eyes to see it, but first we have to see our own sin. Woe is me, says Isaiah. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. He says this because he is in the presence of the Holy One. Think about a time you have been with someone who is nearly purely good and you know you you sense your own guilt and your own sin just being in that person's presence Pickner Pickner says catch a catch a glimpse of your face one morning as you brush your teeth or comb your hair and you look in the mirror and you say well there it is again the same old washed and slept on thing I saw yesterday, I'll see again tomorrow, no better, no worse, and then you look at it and you say, is that really me? Am I really my face? And of course at first you have to say yes, but then you say no, not really, not the face I see right there. I am my face. And I am not, all at the same time. It's strange and confusing, isn't it? Bigner goes on and says, beneath the face there are layers of your cell, and the deepest layers are for the most part hidden from you and from me. There is the conscience, the inner voice that knows that the game face 
I put on at work and at home is not the real me, the me that has done some awful things. So down into the fathoms of the mystery of you, you go, says Buechner, down into the deepest, darkest parts of yourself, into the darkness of your own guilt and the darkness of your own need. Deeper and deeper you go until suddenly the darkness is tinged with gold. And as the poem says, it is the gold of light. And for the first time, you begin to see, as if in a dream, your own true face. It is the face of love. It is the face that is like Christ's face. Woe is me, says Isaiah. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And the seraph fly to him and touch his lips with the live burning coal and the sting of forgiveness opens him to the human face of God who loves and who redeems, the God who will never, ever let you go, no matter how bad you are, the God who is willing to give up everything, even to save one of us. That is the human face of God. But then there is a final face, isn't there? There is the spirit. There is the heavenly face of God, which oddly enough, we only see from our perspective here on earth. It, it is the heavenly face of the poor. It is the heavenly face of the sick and the naked and the putty-colored faces of dying children. If you look into their faces, if you look into the face of someone who seems to be only a nooses to you on the street, you look closely, you will see the very face of God and the Spirit speaking to you to reach out and help. But you look closely, you also see a heavenly face in the faces of those who have caught the contagion of the gospel, who are excited about it, like Isaiah now, and when God says, whom shall I send? Isaiah, who never ever signed up for anything at church, says, here am I, send me. And maybe some of them go to seminary and some of them take the strengths and service class and they go, here am I, I found my true calling. Now I know who I really am. Now I know what it means to be in the zone and to have real Kairos time. Yes, here am I, send me. And you can see the glow on their faces when they really get what God, Father, Son, and Spirit is all about and how they can help themselves. We've seen that glow. You see that glow on grandparents' faces, don't you? Just ask them to tell about your grand, their grandchildren. Have I told you about my grandchildren lately? No, not in the last five minutes. You got any pictures? I thought you'd never ask. I remember a grandpa in Texas so excited. He said, my, my grandson Matt plays baseball for the University of Richmond. He's the best player on the team. He's only a freshman. He has more home runs than anyone else. And this summer, he's going to play on a semi-pro team for Florence, South Carolina. And I'm going. He used to go and sit for two weeks and just watch his grandson. I said, I could just see the glow on his face. I can still see it. And I said, wow, that's exciting. Does he have a major? I don't know. Maybe it's baseball. I'm not sure. That's the glow on Isaiah's face that day. It is the glow of the saints. Not just in stained glass windows, the saints here even in these, this room with us today. Through whom the light of Christ shines every day. They say of Stephen, the day he was martyred, his face shone like the face of an angel. Joe Self's son, Mike, died a couple of weeks ago. He was only 49, way too young to die. A while back, before he got sick, he planned a big cruise for the whole family. They were just about to go on it. And as they stood around his bed at the very end, everyone in the room was wondering, should, should we go on the cruise? 
He's smiling with a glow on his face as if he read their minds. Oh, you know that cruise I planned? I really want you to go. Please go and remember me. And then he went on to heaven. Jesus commissioned his disciples just before he went on to heaven. And in many ways, he said the same thing. He, he, he said, you know that mission that I laid out for you? I want you to go on it. Go ahead. Take the cruise. I'll be fine. And you will be too. And he sent them off in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Three faces of God for you and for me. To this God be all honor and blessing and glory and praise from this day forth and forevermore. God bless you all.